So the next topic we're going to talk about is how to give code to a thread so it can run it concurrently in the background. And you'll see, as we just sort of alluded to in the previous video, there's several different ways of giving code to threads to run them. So let's talk through them. First and foremost, you have to give code to a thread in order for it to do anything. If you create a thread without giving it anything to do, it won't do anything. Even if you start it, it'll just do nothing <laughs> and return right away. So uh, you need to give a, a thread some code to run. In particular, don't use the no argument thread constructor. Uh, I don't even know why they have a no argument thread constructor. It's, it's really not a useful thing at all. Um, and in fact, if you are curious, you can come and click on this link at the bottom of the slides that asks the all important question, why would anyone ever use the Java thread no argument constructor? And the answer is they probably wouldn't. So there's, there's several different ways to give code to Java threads. Here's one way. This is sort of the easiest way, although it's not necessarily the best way. So the easiest way to do it is to simply extend the thread class. This uses good old inheritance, which is an object-oriented programming feature from way back in the, the dawn of time of object-oriented programming, probably 40, 50 years ago. And all you can see we need to do here is we just say public class GCD thread extends thread. So very simple. And once you do that, then it's your obligation to fill in the run hook method. And the run hook method, of course, is where you're going to put the code that will run or will execute when, when the thread is started. And you can read the link at the bottom of the page to learn more about what a hook method is. A hook method is just a name we give to a virtual method or a pure virtual method or an abstract method, as Java likes to call it. And uh, it provides a hook where you are obliged to fill in the details in order to do something useful. Once we have ourselves a GCD thread class, then we just say thread GCD thread equals new GCD thread. And then we say GCD thread dot start. And what that will do, of course, under the hood is it'll allocate the resources necessary to run the thread by some combination of Java execution environment and operating system kernel uh, machinations and mechanisms and machinery and so on. By the way, that's why I showed those funny little icons. It's the machinery of the threads to show what thread stacks look like and so on. And so we start the thread and then that will go ahead and execute the run hook method. You can also write a one liner to create and start an anonymous thread. So this thread, it has a, an object called GCD thread with a lowercase g. So it's a specifically named object that we start. Here we just say new GCD thread dot start. So we're basically chaining together the call to start on an anonymous object. And there are pros and cons of each approach. The uh, next way to do things is a little bit more involved, but has some virtues that we'll talk about later. And that's to simply implement the runnable interface. So runnable is also something that's defined in, in Java. It's been around since day one of Java. And it's basically an interface that has a single method called run. And this is actually something known as a functional interface. We'll perhaps talk a bit more about that later. If, if you take the functional programming class I teach, you know that functional programming interfaces or functional interfaces are important for uh, later versions of Java, modern Java stuff. So the run hook method is what you fill in to do the computation that you want to have run in the context of a thread. But notice that this is not a thread, it's a runnable. There's a couple different ways to implement this using the famous metaphor from the matrix. One way to do this is to make a class that implements runnable. So we can say public class GCD runnable implements runnable. And then we fill in the run hook method to do whatever we want to do. And then we make a new instance of the runnable. So we can say uh, runnable GCD runnable equals new GCD runnable. That makes an instance of the named class. And then we can say new thread, pass in the GCD runnable object, and then start that. So we're making an anonymous thread that's going to run a named object that implements runnable. That's a very common way to do things. So if you look on the left-hand side, you kind of see the, the UML diagram that corresponds to this, where we have the GCD runnable that implements the run method of the runnable interface, which is a functional interface, and then we pass that to the thread constructor. And then when we call start, the wheels begin to spin and 
and the machinery starts to crank and everything is up and running. Here's another way to do this. This is an alternative way that uses something known as an anonymous inner class. So in this case, notice what we do is we say new thread, and then we say new runnable, and we implement the run method anonymously for this object that we create using the anonymous inner class syntax of Java. And then we start that. So that's another way to get the same behavior. Uh, this approach was historically popular, but has fallen into um, uh, disrepute or ill repute or disarray or something with modern features of Java. And we'll talk about that in a second. This, this style of programming, however, is very common in older Java code. So if you're programming with say Java 7 or before, you see a lot, you, a lot of uses of anonymous inner classes. With Java 8 and beyond, so of course we can use it in our class because Android supports Java 8, it's usually better to use the Lambda expression variant of this approach. And the reason for that, as you can see here, is it's one heck of a lot more concise. So this code here is way more concise than that code there, because we have we don't have to type new runnable public void run, blah, 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 blah. All we do is we just say new thread, open paren, open close paren, arrow, which is the Lambda expression syntax. And then we just put the code we want to run within that block. And uh, if, if you only have a one-liner there, you can even leave out the open and close curly brace. So it's, it's super, super concise. Since runnable takes no parameters, it just has an open close paren. If you take parameters, then you can put the parameters uh, inside the open close paren as a list of, of parameters. And we'll talk more about that later when we get further along. Again, this is not a course on functional programming, but if you have knowledge of that, or if you feel like you can master it, strongly recommend you try to use Lambda expressions and their their sibling method references, whatever you can, because it makes things a lot more concise. This approach, however, is unwieldy if you have very large Lambda expressions. If you have a Lambda expression that's 50 lines long, it's probably overkill to put it in line. That's too messy. So in that case, you probably want to factor out the Lambda expression, store it into a variable, like we see here with runnable R, being assigned the Lambda expression, and then just passing that runnable as a parameter to the thread constructor. So that's another way to do things. That also works uh, and is more, more convenient, especially if you want to reuse that, that Lambda expression over and over again. You don't have to keep retyping it and uh, defeating the whole purpose of making your code more concise. So that's the end of the overview of how to give code to a thread. And this will give you a lot of tips about how threads work and, and also teach you when you make a thread the different ways to do things. And, and that'll be very important for uh, programming assignment 1A, as well as other things you'll do in this class or, or other things you'll do if you program with threads in Java.